If you don't understand the new generation, there's a price to pay. There's a price you're going to pay. Because these are not sons of Punjab. These are not sons and daughters of Silet. If they're shouting at one another, if they don't care, this, this is now they're showing their children, this is how you sort your problems out. The dad comes to the masjid and he's like, you know, he's, he's just, he's, he's Mr. Al Capone. He's just part of the mafia, he's just come and he's like, yeah, what's happening? You're a human being who's mature and you haven't got a problem, then you are an insane person because you don't even know what your problem is. The communication wasn't there. They don't communicate and they start to get into a double life. They have a life behind your back. They have a life in front of your face. Some parents are so controlling, they have to have all the siblings and all their wives and all their children and all the grandchildren in a three-bedroom house. Dear respected brothers, and there are sisters who are listening. Yes, there are sisters who are listening. These few moments that we're going to spend together, if I can have your attention. And I'm going to ask you also that if you can put your mobile phones away and not text while I'm actually talking. If you, if you want to multitask, then I want you to do some dhikr. If you want to multitask, you know some people they talk about multitasking. So I'm multitasking. I'm listening to the bayan and I'm also texting at the same time. That kind of multitasking is, this is not the place for that multitasking. This place, the masjid, the house of Allah, the multitasking is that you listen to the bayan and you do the dhikr of Allah Azawajal. You remember Allah. Do your tasbih while you sit here. While I'm talking to you, subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al While I'm talking to you, just subhanallah. While I'm talking to you, la ilaha illallah. Do as many as you can. While I'm talking to you, do any other dhikr you want. And to be honest with you, the, the people who lived before us, the generation before us, they were more lucky than ourselves. The reason why they were lucky is because for them to sin was more difficult than for us to sin. For this new generation to sin is very easy. Very, very easy. In fact, it doesn't even take, it doesn't even take planning to sin. So easy. There are families where the... And I've had people come to me and tell me this. I've had a Musalli once who came to me and he said, he asked. He said, I'd like to marry this particular girl. I said, fine. But he said, I need your help. I said, what do you need my help for? He said, because I've met her over the internet. How did he meet her over the internet? Some kind of chat from Arva said, okay, so where's this all going? He said, well, she's from a very religious background. She wears niqab. She doesn't come out of the house normally. And her father wouldn't know anything about this. Her family wouldn't know anything about this, that she's on the, the uh, she's, she's actually on the uh, you know, internet and doing this. And through this, I have basically made contact with her. And it's going to be very difficult for me now to go and to propose and so on. It's going to be very difficult for me. So I need you to go and to do something. Now, subhanAllah, when I carried on talking to him, he's already gone to a cafe to meet her. A niqabi sister, whose family doesn't even allow her to go out of the house without the niqab. And privately, without the mahram involved, without anything, they've already met in the cafe. <coughs> This was how long ago? This was about 14 years ago. I'm not talking about today's internet, brothers. I'm talking about 14 years ago when MSN was out. You know, the first email chat rooms that they started to create. You can imagine how sophisticated it is today. Today, subhanAllah, the whole world is at your fingertips. On one phone, everything, your Facebook, your Twitter, everything there. 14 years ago, he meets her in a cafe. Without the father's knowledge, the father is a very religious person. Father is a, you know, he's always in khuruj fi sabilillah. And the mother is very pious. No one would have ever seen her without, you know, no one would have ever seen her face. Even this girl, no one would have seen her face. 
And I've heard not only this one case, I've heard other cases. Where a brother from up north, he comes all the way down to London. This is from, I think, Newcastle or something. All the way down to London to meet his sister, who they had a chat over the phone, and they'd be talking and talking and talking and talking until, boom. They met each other physically in London. This is one of them telling me this. And I've had so many cases like this where they've told me that none the family don't even know. Both sides, the family don't even know. And I'm getting more and more of these cases where they are sitting in the living room. She's got her father in front of her. Her father sends her to the masjid. She's one who goes out the house with the hijab. She's 14 years old. And her father is right in front of her while he's sitting on the other sofa. She's sitting on this sofa with her phone towards her. She's smiling at her father, talking to him and multitasking by talking to her boyfriend. Muslim girl who wears a hijab. And how do I know this? Because I found out about this. And first hand, this is not second hand information. This is first hand information. And what do you do with, with, with all these cases? The big thing for us to remember is that brothers and sisters, the life that we've got today, the family life that we've got today, is very, very different from yesterday. Very, very different from yesterday. And the difference is, my brothers, is that if we are not careful by understanding the new generation, we are going to get into a position where we're going to lose ourselves with the generation. Now, there's a balance between the two. One is to understand the generation, and there's a balance between how to control the generation. Now, controlling and being able to be in charge, brothers, there's a price to pay. There's a, and, and mothers who are listening to this, there's a price to pay. If you don't understand them, if you don't understand the new generation, there's a price to pay. There's a price you're going to pay. And if you don't know how exactly and exactly where to balance in terms of controlling them, there's a price you're going to pay. Either you're going to be too lenient with them, or you're going to get too tough with them. There's a price to pay on both sides. Those parents who are too lenient with their children, or they're more on the lenient side than the strict side, they pay a price. And those parents who get too strict, they pay a price as well. Because these are not sons of Punjab. These are not sons and daughters of Silet. These are not sons of Karachi. These are sons of London. My friend, these are sons of Edinburgh. These are sons of Nottingham. These are sons of Leicester. These are sons of Birmingham. These are sons of Manchester. These are a different breed. And the first big mistake is what? The first big mistake is not to actually communicate with them or understand them. And the second big mistake is to get it wrong when you control them. And I'll tell you one mistake before this. I'm going to come to this again. I'm going to revisit this again. The one before that is, you know, this whole generation here, most of you have got black hair, black beards. Yeah? Most of you have got that. You are a different breed from your parents. And your parents, they're a different breed from your grandparents. And your grandparents, they're a different breed from your great-grandparents. Every generation that comes, you have to accept it that they're going to be different. Now why am I saying this? I remember the, um, the, there was a person who came and he complained to my sheikh about family life. And he was complaining about his son. And my sheikh said, he said, just accept it. The age you lived in, the era you lived in, that era has gone. Accept it, it's gone. This era that he's living in, it's a new era. You have to accept that mentally. Where most parents get it wrong is where? Is that they base everything on their age, on their era. Now come on, if I lived on farmlands and I grew up, and suddenly I got a visa and I came to this country, and I worked very hard through toiling through all these different factories and I made my money. And then after that I basically got, got enough to do what I wanted to and I went back home and I built whatever I had to do, you know, build at home. If I, if I did that, if I did that, that's a different generation that I would... These kids, they've gone through a whole schooling system that I've probably never even seen, never even knew of. 
These kids have gone through a whole schooling system that I never even went through. I don't even understand this. They're not in this toil, hardship of factory work and all that. They never even went through that. They're going to work in different places, different shops. They're going to have university and fees and things that are, I've never even dreamt of. I was from the, if I was from the old generation. So my sheikh said, look, he's, you've got to accept it's a different, it's a different era. Now that era that we had before, there was a lot more arranged marriages. And there's a lot more, and a few, sorry, a few forced marriages even. A lot more arranged marriages and a few forced marriages. Even today you've got arranged marriage, which is fine. But remember brothers and remember sisters, that with arranged marriages, there's a balance, you better get it right. The balance is that, okay fine, you're trying to arrange them, but you're trying to find the best compatibility between two people. Don't arrange it and then push them forward, shove them forward and say, Inshallah, say yes, you'll be alright. Go on, just say yes, you'll be alright. Oh, to kya samajhti hai? What do you understand? What would you know about? Now it's true. Their understanding is limited, fine. Your experience is much greater, but there's a balance, don't break it. And things, Alhamdulillah, I'm hearing now that those arranged marriages that are kind of partially forced marriages are coming to an end. They're coming to an end. And inshallah, inshallah, bi'ithnillah, they will come to an end. If it's arranged marriages where in the end both of them are really happy, Alhamdulillah, go forward. No one said nothing wrong with that. But if they really don't know each other, especially when you don't even know them. You know what I find really funny is, that within many of these arranged marriages, yeah, the to-be groom's father and to-be bride's father, they know each other. They really like each other. They're friends and they're pals. And he says, Oh, meri beti, tumara beta. Kitna achcha hoga. My, my daughter, your son, how wonderful it will be. And these two are pals. They get on with each other. If there was an arranged marriage between these two fathers, Alhamdulillah, we're fine. <laughs> but listen guys, you two are not getting married. You two are not getting married. Or there's two sisters, two aunties we've got. They love each other. They, they you know, all, every time chai after chai, they're loving it. Phone after phone, they're loving it. Oh, meri beti, oh, tumhara beta, do, bas thoro shadi karao, bas. Now what do you know about her beti, and what do you know about her beta? What do you know about them? You don't know nothing. They're from a different generation, you don't even understand their language. And even when they, with their attitudes and all of that, you don't even understand that. And not only that, you only know their performance. This is the biggest mistake any marriage can go wrong, is that you base things on performance and not on character. Brothers, what you're seeing of me right now, it's my performance. Aha! All those YouTube things you watch, it's my performance. You didn't know I was like this, so now I'm diving away from you guys to do. You know, how do you know how I am in my, in my private life? How do you know? You probably think that I'm the same when I give lectures to you, I'm the same everywhere. You probably think that. And I'm thinking you're the same. Look at you, mashallah, all of you sitting nice and, nice and quietly. Kitna adab hai aapke andar, mashallah. How much respect you have. MashaAllah, Monona, you've got a very good crowd here. MashaAllah, not a single person speaking. MashaAllah, that's how they must be when they go home, isn't it? Right? What do you know? What do we know about who's who? Performance is when you do what you do when you need to put it on. And most people, in fact, almost 100% of people, when they're coming to marriage, they will put a performance on. And performance can be a daily routine. You know, daily people go to work, 9 to 5. Daily, 9 to 5. 8 hours a day there are people who put performance on. The guy goes to work, goes, Hi Andrew, hi man, you alright? Yeah, 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 good day man, good day man. Smiling, he's smiling. He goes to work, suited, booted, got nice perfume on, smiling all the time. And, and he's been trained to do this. He's trained to pick up the phone. Um, this is... Anglian in Easter, yeah, well, well, what can we do for you, sir? sir? And I hope you're having a nice day. And yes, yes, I, if I can do the prize for you differently, of course, of course, I, I could do that deal for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> if you're interested in another deal, I could, this is all training. You talk to the guy in his office, how he conducts with everyone else, performance, performance. The guys who come to the masjid, performance. I've seen so many. They come to the masjid, performance. 
کیا کیا ٹھیک ہو اب بس خیریت سے اب بس اب بس یار بس نئی گل سے نا یار از اوز اسمائلنگ ان دا مسجد پرفارمنس دا کیریکٹر یو ہیونٹ گوٹ ٹو نو یٹ دا کیریکٹر از وین دا مین از اور دا وومن از ہر نارمل سیلف نائن ٹو فائیو ورک پرفارمنس اینڈ کمز ہوم اینڈ دین وٹ ہی ڈز ہوم ٹو ہم سیلف ہم ریئل سیلف دیٹ ہیز از کیریکٹر when he when he's comfortable with who he really is and he displays that that's his character and the same with people who come to masjid there are people who come to masjid and they do all of that and when they go home when they go home they don't even speak to the family members properly there are people who come five times a day to the masjid mashallah the guys got I've, you know i don't know if you've seen this or not maybe you haven't seen this in the area but up north this has been reported to me from uh, several different sources yeah Mashallah, the, the man, he's got a white beard and his beard is coming up to his belly. Yeah? And he's always five times a day in the masjid. On a Saturday night, if you want to know where he is, he's standing in a queue. Yeah? And that queue, he's waiting to buy a ticket. And that ticket, he's buy, trying to buy on the Saturday night, religiously, which he's doing every single week, is a lottery ticket. Lottery ticket. Guy with his topi on his head. Kurta. He's wearing. Why? But I'm not saying they all do this. Okay, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they all do this. But this is, this is now character versus performance. You go to the guy, same guy in the masjid, he says, Astaghfirullah ji, haan ji, yeh log joke karte hai na, yeh bilkul galat hai. Bilkul galat hai. Haan. Yeh, kaise karte hai? He'll tell you, give you a lecture on it. The guy will give you a lecture on it. And he himself, he goes and does this. Character and performance, don't mix the two. That's why when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was asked about a per- certain person, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, he said, do you know the person that you're going to do business with? He said, I know him well. He said, do you know him? He said, I know him. He said, how do you know him? He said, I just know him. He said, no, you don't know him. Have you had good transactions with him, muamalat with him, transactions, where you traded with him? He said, no. He said, have you lived as neighbors with him? He said, no. Have you traveled with him? He said, no. He said, then you do not know him. These three things reveal character. Traveling with somebody. Because when you're traveling with somebody, they can't carry on putting on the performance on. <laughs> have you been to someone with Hajj? You need someone to a long journey. Yeah? Umrah, Hajj, whatever. Yeah? You can put the performance on Hajj, 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 Kese, Otika, Rafi, Wanya. Hajj, Bas, yeah? Bas, yeah? Abu Dhani, bas, so jaya. You know, you can see the frustration coming out after a little while. And the more longer you spend with them, the more of the character comes out. If you, a neighbor, someone's neighbor, and if you know them as neighbors, not as societal people. See, masjid is a societal place. It's not, an, it's not a neighboring place. Unless, of course, after many years, you hear everything of what's going on, and then you pick up on who, what kind of person this, this person really is at home. That's different. But if, you, if it's just a masjid, normally people come to masjid, it's a, social, it's a place where a religious place is a social place. So they don't they really want to reveal their character here. They don't want to do that. It's not the best place to find out. Yes, you can find out, but it's not the best place to find out. The real fi- place to find out is where they're homely, where their home is. Okay? And either, either trading with someone, you know when you trade with someone on a long term basis, and you've done mar- so money, trading, having promises, whether they keep the promise, whether they don't keep the promise, all these things add up to what? Add up to you knowing what the actual character is. So why I'm saying this brothers and sisters who are listening is, that when our parents got married, one thing that perhaps might have happened is, they might have gone through some of this, where they probably never knew each other. When I'm going through marriage, when a recent marriage has happened, maybe it has, hasn't worked out, whatever it was with knowing the person, but what's the next thing to do? is that remember that love is something, love is something that you cannot teach in a classroom. Love is something you can't teach in a classroom. Love is something which you have to experience. Love is given through live experiences. If I ask you what is love right now, what's the definition of love? You're going to say, well, you just like them. What does that mean? On Facebook, everyone likes each other. Hmm. On Facebook, you've got about 71 likes, 101 likes here, that many likes here, likes, likes doesn't mean anything. Likes is something that they might have their interest, interest 
in that thing. They kind of like it, but love is something different. Love is not liking. And love is something that comes from the heart. Love is not something which you do with the mind. Most of these uh, people who are getting together without knowing each other, without knowing each other, and getting together in a life that is really serious, they're probably basing it on their minds, not on their hearts. And whatever has happened, my brothers and my sisters, to, to have a family who loves each other, you have to give them love in the first place. They have to experience love. So, I don't care what's happened in your past. I haven't got time to go through this for two, three hours. I'm only going to have another, you know, just over half an hour to speak to you. But what I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, is whatever has happened to our past, from today's talk here, you're going to put the past behind. And what you're going to do is, you're going to try and give and show, show and demonstrate love. If you demonstrate love, you get love back. And some people, they go into, you know some people, a lot of people do this. They have different characters for different places. Different characters for different places. So for work, they have one character. For home, they have another character. And it switches with family members. It switches with friends. I seen, have you seen some guys that is, uh, they pick up the phone and they go, Hello? Hello? Yeah? Who's it? So he says, it's, you know, so, so. Oh, oh yeah, 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 how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are, yeah, 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 yeah. Now you see that switch? You see that switch? Hello? Now if that guy wasn't his close friend, he would, hello? Yeah? Okay? Uh. People have barriers that I understand, yeah? But normally he's like, okay, I'm going to use this, this, this character of mine. Yeah? Alright? Yeah? Yeah? No? Okay? Yeah? No? That's all you hear from him. But if it's his close one, or somebody else, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, man. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that. He's different. He talks different. When he's talk, talking to his own, own uh, family member, each family member, they differ sometimes. With one generation talks one way, with another generation talks another way. Now what's important to understand here is, why is he doing this? If he's doing it to keep the peace, that's fine. But if he's doing it because he doesn't have love, he only gives it where he's got his own matlab, where he's got his own need. You know, there's, there's this new generation growing up, they're very, not, I'm not saying the whole generation like this, but the, the environment and the things that we've got and we've had, especially this generation right now in front of us, I'm not talking about just the young kids here, I'm talking about the 20 year olds and the 30 year olds. We've lived a very selfish community, in a very selfish life. And selfishness creates selfishness. Every technology that you've got breeds selfishness. You know when, you, when a family is sitting and they're watching TV, this is selfishness. Because every, fa every family member watching that TV is focused on the TV itself. They're not focused on one another. It's individualism. It's, separation. it's separating them. When family members together in the same household and they're all on different different networks and computers and phones and technologies it's selfishness when family members come together to the table that's not selfishness that's now a family unit when families eat together as a family unit when families do jama'ah together if they're not going to the masjid they do jama'ah together that's unity when families together they will make mashwara they will make even in the household to, to consult one another, to give one another that right to say what the opinion is. Okay, the father is going to be the one who decides. That is unity, that is consultation, that is getting together. But when one member says, no, I'm going to do how I like, I don't care. I'm just going to do how I like. And he's not taking any opinion from any of the other rest of the family, then that's selfishness that has been created. Are you understanding what I'm saying, brothers? You understanding? Yep, I think you're either hungry or you're tired. Are you understanding? Yes, exactly. Or maybe you're the victims of all of this. Yeah, that's why you're looking at me and thinking, well, how does he know her? what's happening? <laughs> when family members do this, I'm not basing it on, on your, your society, I'm basing it on, on, on generally. Because I'm an imam and as any imam, you'll get people coming to you and they'll tell you a lot of things and you can base what's happening in their families depending on what they've said to you. What I want to say to you is that it depends on what's happening now. Love is something which you have to share. 
How's that? The first love is the parents have to demonstrate to their children that the parents are loving one another. They love one another as individuals. If the love, my friend, this society, this new generation has been ta- taught, experienced, love is to do with the skin. Love is to do with beauty. Love is to do with an extremely beautiful woman or an extremely beautiful man. That's what love is. Love is your shahwa and your passions. If that is love, the moment the skin is old or not the same young skin, the moment the beauty has gone, that's when that love is going to diminish as well. That is not love, brothers and sisters. This whole Western society teaches that. Love is what you like, what you kind of find good for yourself. This is what I call the matlabuddin. Now some people I call it matlabuddin. Where their where they whole anything is, they are matlab if you mean that. They're, they're people of their own thing. Where they like something, where their own objective is, where their own ambition is, where their own goal is, where their own hobbies are, they will like it and they will go for it. But where their own thing is not there, they don't care. That is not love. Love is something where you experience it together and you give and you share with one another love. Now we're talking about family life here and love in the family life. Number one is that the parents have to demonstrate and they have to show one another love. And not only that, they have to show it in front of the children. The children have to understand how. And there's going to be circumstances where the parents have got a difference of opinion. There's going to be circumstances where one falls out temporarily with another one, or is not talking to, or not, not wanting to have, you know, that lovely conversation. But it's how you conduct yourself. Brothers and sisters, if at that moment the, the parents get really angry, if they're shouting at one another, if they don't care, this, this is now they're showing their children, this is how you sort your problems out. The one who shouts the loudest, wins the argument. Are you teaching them that? The one who has got the greatest force, wins the argument. The one who is best at emotional blackmail, wins the argument. The one who can be upset and not talk to the other individual the longest period of time, wins the argument. If you're going to start showing that, then your children without any teaching, they would have picked that up. And if what I'm teaching is afu, if I'm teaching afu, if I'm teaching Forgiveness, then forgiveness is taught by demonstrating forgiveness. It's not taught through a lecture. My brothers, my sisters, what I'm saying to you is that in the household, you can be a dad and you can be a mom, you can be a brother, you can be an older person, and you can say, look, we must forgive one another, we must do this, and you can give as many lectures as you want. But the best, the best teaching in the house was how the elders demonstrated it. And if they demonstrated forgiveness, if they demonstrated forgive and forget, if they demonstrated let go, let go of these things. If they demonstrated that we're not going to brood over things, we're not going to go into a horrible mood. If they demonstrated that, then the children automatically will pick that up. I've seen families, I've seen families where the son is a compulsive liar. And he's what? He's at, in his mid 30s. Mid 30s. This is, I'm talking about current situation. A few years back. Mid 30s, he's a compulsive liar. He goes to the masjid. He's even part of, you know, running the masjid. But he's a compulsive liar. He lies when he wants. He's, he's, he's got his own matlab. But then I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute. Where did this all happen from? How did this kid grow up? And after having dealings with his father, I understood that his father does exactly the same thing. His father is also a liar. When he wants to lie, he will lie. Because he grew up in that household, Traits automatically pass down. Character automatically passes down. These demonstrations we've got with our character automatically passes down. And now I'm looking at his kids, that man's kids who's in his 30s. And I can see his kids are living a selfish life. My brothers, my sisters, giving your family whatever they want, whenever they want, is not love. Giving presents is good. I'm saying giving presents is good. But just giving him a present, buying him eat presents, and buying him that, that's not love. That's not love. Nah. If you're making that mistake, you're making a big mistake. This is happiness. It's not love. This is showing them that you like them on this occasion. But this is not love. Love is when they know from their heart 
when they know from their heart that this person, he really, really cares about me and my whereabouts. That is love. So the balance here is, you know that thing I said to you earlier on, about control. If you understand a person, if you understand them properly, you can understand what age they are. You can relate to them to that age. And this is another, another thing I want to say to you brothers and sisters, please remember this. Is that, please don't base your child's life, your young one's life, according to your life right now. No, no, no. Put your hands up here, in this gathering here. I've got a lot of, old, I've got a lot of people who have grown up here. Most of you grown up. Put your hands up here. If when you were a child, you and you came to a social gathering or a masjid or somewhere, and you never ran around, put your hands up. Come on, Come on put your hands up. Who? Who's the Firishta here? <laughs> Who's the angel here? One? No one. See, no one. Is there a kid who's going to be seven? Who's going to be six? Who's going to be young? Five years old? The younger it is, the more they're going to start running around. Right? We all know that. Is there a kid that will not do that? So why is it that when a kid does that in the masjid, Why is it that I, at the age of 40, at the age of 50, have to... Because I'm basing on mine. I'm basing on my life. Kids shouldn't run around. They shouldn't be doing this. What kind of thing is this? When we were small, we never used to do that. Well, why don't you just put your hand up then? <laughs> why don't you just put your hand up? Look, it's a new generation, let's accept it. It's a new generation. But what you've got to understand, my friend, is you've had 50 years of experience. If you are 50 years old and still running around in the masjid, we'll say, you have to go to a mental hospital. <laughs> if that was the case. But come on, let's, let's base it on what the age is. But also, my friends, a 10-year-old, 20-year-old needs to understand and have respect for his 50-year-old and 40-year-old. You have to do both ways. I'm not saying one way here. Because these people, our elders, they have got experience which you haven't got. And you will not get even if you read every book in the world. The experience that our elders have got, the 50 year old and the 40 year old, the experience they've got, you can't buy that. You can't buy that. You can only sit at their feet and learn from them. So there's got to be a balance. But in the communication, the understanding is number one. You have to understand them. There are parents who don't understand the children. There are children who don't understand the parents. Number one rule that Rasulullah he said what? He said, مَن لَمْ يَرْحَمْ صِغَارَنَا وَلَمْ يُوَقِّرْ كِبَارَنَا فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا He said, whosoever doesn't have mercy on our young ones, and whoever doesn't recognize the burden on our elders, and respect them for it, then they are not from us. He's given it both ways, both ways. Both generations have to understand each other. The biggest problem we're facing here is, there are completely different fragmentations, where they can't at all understand one another. They can't understand one another. And because they can't understand one another, the next thing is the controlling element gets wrong. Either they become too liberal, or they become too hard, like I said earlier. Either they become too liberal or they become too strict. And each, e either one you go towards, you will break the ties and you will break the relationship. And the mahabba and the love cannot pass on if you don't understand the generation. A lot of families, the mother's too lenient because the father's too strict. A lot of, lot of people have grown up how? The father's too strict. Yalla, yalla, bafe hunle, yalla. If his father finds out, oh my God, oh my God, you know, he's going to be dead meat. So I better, I better cover him, I better cover his faults. Now she's gone one extreme and the dad's gone the other extreme. The dad comes to the masjid and he's like, you know, he's, he's just, he's, he's Mr. Al Capone. He's just part of the mafia, he's just come and he's like, yeah, what's happening? And he says, I saw you son, I said, yeah, what can I do? I beat him up so badly, so badly, my hands are hurting. <laughs> so, yeah, man, rape me, you know, rape me, see. He is part of this thing where he has to come be macho man. He has to tell his other, you know, his age lot that look how tough I am. Look what I did. Yeah. My wife the other day, she wasn't listening to me. I told her to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> macho man. He wants to show that he is macho man through this. And his wife's gone to the other extreme. 
She wants to hide every fault her kid is doing at home. And she's bending every rule and at the same time making the curries even nicer. So he doesn't ever, ever question anything. So the curries are getting even nicer, everything's on time, she's working clockwork, everything's happening, right? She's always saying salam to him and leaves the house, but when he's left the house, the house is different. And he probably knows it or doesn't know it, or he doesn't want to even know about it. And she, in the, in the, behind his back, she's doing all this. I know families where the father comes five times to the masjid. And the mother behind his back will allow the daughters to wear makeup and to leave the house. To take the hijab off and leave the house. Because she feels that they're missing out. So she's gone to one extreme and he's gone to another extreme where if he ever finds out, it's going to be the end of everything. That kind of thing, it doesn't work. My brothers, my sisters, you want to get a family together, the two, the heads of the families, they have to communicate. They have to communicate. They have to put their principles down. They have to say, what is it that we want out of our kids? And before our kids, what is it that me and you are going to do? Where, what is my life based on? What's your life based on? It's very important, brothers. Very important. Because Allah Azza wa Jal has said what? Allah Azza wa Jal has told us that if you want to be a person who is a person who is noble in the sight of Allah, you have to have taqwa. And taqwa is not based on my nafs. Taqwa, God consciousness, is not based on my nafs, on my, on my selfishness. It's not based on my selfishness. Number one is I as the father of the family. Number two is she as the mother of the family. Both of us have to submit to what? To Allah Azza wa Jal. I'm not going to do anything wrong to you that is wrong in the sight of Allah and His Messenger. You're not going to do anything wrong to me which is wrong in the sight of Allah and His Messenger. Let's make that the rule. I'm not going to miss my salah because that is wrong in the sight of Allah. You're not going to miss your salah. I'm not going to make my life based upon a worldly life and you're not going to do that. Our life is going to be based on the akhirah. So therefore, if it's based on the akhirah, I'm going to spend time with Allah and His Messenger. How? Through the Qur'an and through the sunnah, I'm going to spend my time. And you're going to do that, my, my wife. Both of us have to submit to what? To, to the law of Allah. That's, that's the first thing. If the father feels that his life, it doesn't matter. Who is she? What's he going to say? She's just a woman. She can't tell me what to do. I'm the man of the house. I will do what I want. I will come when I want. I will do what I want. I don't need to tell her what. Well, I'm going to find. That's fine. But if, you, if it's to do with you traveling and coming home, that's fine. But if it's to do with the authority of Allah, who is she to tell me about my, whether I woke up in the morning for Fajr or not? Who is she? Who are you? What are you telling me for? Go and do, do your own salah. لا حول ولا قوة إلا Now, Barabara, you based it on your nafs. You based it on your selfishness. And if you base it on your selfishness, when your kids base their life on selfishness, don't complain. See, they come to you. Imam probably knows this. Any Imam will know this. They come to you when the kids are 16, 17. And then they'll say to you, Imam Sahib, Imam Sahib, make dua please. Make dua please. Why? My son, he's not listening to me. He not listen to me. Make dua. Imam Sahib, have you got something you, I can take home, then you blow on him? No. Hmm. Now the thing is, somebody came to Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab the same way. And he said, Oh Umar, he said, and this is Umar ibn khattab radiallahu anhu. And he said, my son doesn't listen to me. So Sayyidina Umar said, bring your son. See, this was, this is, this is, subhanallah, this is an imam. He said, bring your son. An imam should not ever deal with a case without listening to both sides and giving them a good say. Always listen to both sides. So he called the other party, he called the son. He said, let me listen. Son, why don't you listen to your father? So the son explained what's happening in his life, how his father is with him. And then Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he commented to the father. He called the father over. And he said to the father, أَهْمَلْتَهُ صَغِيرًا فَيُهْمِلَكَ كَبِيرًا He said, you have neglected him while he was young, and now he's neglecting you while you're old. It's one tick for tack, one for the other. Subhanallah al This is Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab. He didn't say to the father, okay, bring your son, let me take my whip out, let me lash him. How dare he not listen to his father now? This is Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab who could have done that. But he called the son over and he got to understand what's in the mind and the heart of the son. And he saw that the father had neglected him 16 years of life. 
And now the son doesn't want to listen to his father. Well, of course, you give him selfish, you give him selfish attitudes for 16 years of life, for 17, 18 years. You don't care about your own wife, his mother. It's your wife, that's fine. But it's his mother. That's why when Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned the, the, you know, your family life in the Quran, He didn't say, وَالْأَزْوَاجُ يُرْضِعْنَا أَوْلَادَهُنَّ or وَالزَّوْجَاتِ He didn't say that. He said, وَالْوَالِدَاتِ يُرْضِعْنَا أَوْلَادَهُنَّ He didn't say that your wives have to breastfeed your children. He didn't say that. He said that the mothers, mothers, um, the link Allah put there, they will breastfeed their children. Allah has said what? That they are now mothers. They're not your wives anymore. They've got a maqam, they've got a respect, they've got a status in the family. They are, they come, they, in terms of even the virtues of the children towards them. The mothers come first, and the mothers come second, and the mothers come third, and then you come next. Allahu Akbar, that's the status of the mother. She has, she has that status. So now you can't treat her just as your wife, you have to treat her as a mother to your children. See, most people when they get married, they don't even ask this question. They don't say to themselves, is she going to, they, they say to themselves, they say, she's, she's going to be a beautiful wife. Inshallah, mashallah. She's going to be a beautiful wife. But they don't think about a beautiful mother. See? They don't think about how beautiful mother she's going to be. How caring mother she's going to be. How much love can she give? That's why when Rasulullah talked about marriage, he said what? Tazawwaju al walud al wadud. He said, marry those women who can give children, yes, but wadud, who have a lot of love in themselves. A lot of love, a lot of compassion, a lot of mercy in their heart. If, they, if a mother has a lot of unconditional love for her children, her children will grow up with that love. That's where the family life and the unit and the bond will all come. But if the mother can't give that, and the father doesn't give that, and the father doesn't control that, and they've had years of living like this, then subhanallah, don't complain. Don't complain to your imam how your household is. Your household is how you shaped it. Your household is, my household is how I'm shaping it. Now subhanallah, my children, if they're growing, if they're growing, and they grow and they see where they're, where they're two people, the father and the mother, they're sharing things. They show mercy to one another. And their life is dependent on the akhirah. How does a life, how will the children see life depend on akhirah? It's not you and me lecturing them, brothers and sisters. No, no, no. It's me and the musalla. It's me and my, with my dhikr. It's me with my, with my surahs, my tilawa. It's me with my, with my akhirah, with my Allah. And they will watch and they will know whether I'm enjoying it or whether I'm not enjoying it. Brothers, please listen to this carefully. If my, if my household time, when I spend time with my TV, and when my, or the, the one person spends time with the cooker, and they're basically cooking or I'm spending with TV, that becomes three hours, two and a half hours, non-stop. Three hours, non-stop, getting everything right, watching the movie properly, not missing a single minute, pausing it when you have to go to the toilet. Go to the toilet, use the toilet, come back again, play again. Yeah? He never missed a single minute of it. He's taking ded full dedication towards it. Yeah? But when it comes to my salah, there's neglect. When it comes to my salah, there's quickness. Quick, quick salah. Quick salah. The children are watching this demonstration of Islam is in front of their eyes. They know which one you have love for. Do you have love for this world or do you have more love for the next world? They're making their mind up. And no one's teaching them this. You are demonstrating it to them. If years and years go by, they will have already seen when problems come. What does my father do when a problem comes? Do I, when my problem comes, do I get stressed out? Now if I get stressed out with a problem, now everyone's got problems. If you haven't got a problem and you're sitting here, then you must be an insane person. If you, got, if you haven't got a problem, you're a human being who's mature and you haven't got a problem, then you are an insane person because you don't even know what your problem is. <laughs> All right? <laughs> the only person is that. Otherwise, everyone who's mature has got problems. But the thing is, the children are watching you to see how you deal with the problems. Do you come home stressed and take it out on your wife? There are guys who get stressed outside and they come home, they take it out on their wives. There are women who get stressed outside, they come home, they take it out on their husbands. Am I talking sense guys? Yes? It happens everywhere. But these people are what? These people didn't base it on Allah and His Messenger. These people based on their soul, their nafs, the people of nafs, the people of selfishness. How do you make crime in your own beloved house? 
Your beloved wife, your beloved husband, Allahu Akbar. The person who loves you, the person who's married you, the person who wants to spend a lifetime with you, that person is supposed to console you, and you're not supposed to bring that stress out in front of her or in front of him. It's wrong, it's a crime. And how many houses, and how many, how many fathers, and how many mothers in front of the children are doing this? The guy is stressed because of work. The guy is stressed because of business. The guy is stressed because of mustard politics. The guy is stressed because of societal politics. The guy is stressed because of so many things. The woman stressed because of what's happening in her life, what, what other women are saying, what some, something happened, some failure happened, whatever it was, whatever it is. And in front of the family members, all they're doing is they're bringing the stress. And now if you come home and you bring your stress, you're stressed. What's supposed to, what should you have done? You should have basically put tawakkal to Allah. I have depended on Allah. I'm, my children should see me making longer du'as. My children should see me praying more nawafil. My children should see me, yes, I have, have got gham. I've got a worry. But my worry is with Allah. My worry is when I speak to my wife as well about my worry, I talk to her calmly. I don't make her the victim of my worries. I don't take it out on her. I'm not snapping. I'm not shouting. I'm not becoming moody. I'm not becoming grumpy. I'm not cornering myself in the house. I'm not doing any of that. This is a man who is basing on what? Basing on Allah and investing, which is what? You come home, you can talk to your wife. A wife comes, she can talk to her husband. But you talk together. You two people love each other. So don't bring the problems outside, inside and create another problem for yourself. Children are watching and they're learning. They're hearing, they're learning. They've seen it, they're learning. Because that's telling them how to react in their situations. When you have kids who have grown up and they're 18 and 19 and brothers and sisters who are not talking to each other, I blame the whole family unit from top first to the bottom. I don't just look at those 18 year olds and 17, they don't suddenly change. Unless they spend 4-5 or five years outside in the university, they weren't even home. Yes, that can change them. An environment changes people. Brothers and sisters, please remember, the environment is the most important thing after one another. We create that environment. What is your environment telling you? What is the environment? This environment, what does this environment tell you? The masjid, what does it tell you? It tells you ibadah. What does a club tell you? A club tells you to go there and dance. And to be socialized and whatever. Every environment tells you something different. What does the environment of your house say? Does your house mean to your children, I come home, put my feet up, watch whatever I want, and watch and play technology and be with my phone and not with my family. If you've made that environment, they will fit in that environment. But as my children are growing up, I have to demonstrate what the environment should be. Me and my wife have to do that. And not only that, but remember there's a different generation here and we have to understand them and get them to communicate. How will I get them to communicate? I have to talk to them, spend time with them. My brothers, my brothers, ilm is one thing and irfan is another. Knowledge of something is one thing and recognition is another. I can know you but I may not really recognize you. There's two things. They're two separate things. I've said salam to you. I know you. I see you every day in the masjid. I know you. But I don't really recognize you from deep inside. Recognizing someone from deep inside is irfan. Family members, they recognize one another from deep inside. And it can only happen when I spend time. My son has got problems. My daughter has got problems. Have I allowed that, that platform for them to even speak to me? If I become such a father, such a mother, I don't want to hear about their problems, then they'll never come to me with the problems. But do you think they're going to keep inside? No, 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 no. They're going to go and tell somebody else about their problems. I would as the father rather know their problems than for a friend of theirs to know the problems. Do you agree or not? I as a mother, whoever that is, sister is that listening, you should know, you should know that you should become the source for them to communicate with you. But there's a balance here, my friends. The balance is what? Once you know the problem, you've got now a manner. This person has spoken about whatever problems they've got. You care for them, you love them. Now you've got to balance it. You've got to be very careful here. If you go to one extreme, where you confide in them so much, uh, you say to them, that's it, just me and you will sort this problem out, I don't want to involve everyone else, anyone else, and you know that others need to know about this, then you created another problem for yourself. But if you also become the other, which is they've confided in you, and you go straight away tell the husband, 
Or did you hear? She's gone through this. Oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh my God. And you overreact to the situation, then they will never open to you again. There's a very delicate balance that you have to get from them, especially teenagers. Especially teenagers. My household, it is based on Islam. And my son is found. I know my son. I'm going to say to you something which most Imams won't say to you on the mimbar. They won't say this to you. But I'm going to say this to you because I feel for these brothers and sisters. He's maybe 18 or 19 or 20. And he's got himself in a relationship. And I'm hearing about this in my own society. That he's in a relationship. If I... I can go to two extremes. I can either ignore it. I can either totally ignore it and act if nothing happened. Or I can go to the other extreme of getting into it and sorting it out in the wrong way. Now look, if you have got communication, you can talk to them. You can t- if you really think that the girl is bad, fine. You talk to your son and you talk to- if you've made that platform, you can talk to him in a nice way and get him out of that if it's a bad relationship. If the girl's not good for him. But you need to understand the environment is very important. You can't tell your son, son, give her up. But son, carry on going to the same university. (laughs) That's not going to work. If you think that she's not right for your son, you talk to him and you communicate with him and you get him out of that relationship. But by, through what? Through hikmah, through wisdom. Not through beating him up, not through you know, separating from him, not through shouting at him, (coughs) not through you know, boycotting him. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it might work, not always. Boycotting doesn't always work. You have to know how to play the game. You know your son better. But I'm saying the other thing is that if your son is 20 years old, and he's found a nice girl who has taqwa in her. I know families, the girl, she is a very nice girl. She's got taqwa. She's a very sweet girl. From her character she's sweet. People have given reference. Even myself, I know her as a student. Or I know her as a person who's been in my community. And then there's another boy that you know, they've met each other. Now they want to get together with each other. But the father says, the father might say that she's not Pakistani. The father might say she's not Bengali. The father might say, no way. The mother might say, oh my God, on my deathbed. But the taqwa is there. Now you've got to understand, brothers and sisters, you've got to understand... If I base my life on taqwa, if I base it on Allah and His Messenger, and this girl, if, if, okay, I'm not saying every case is like this, but if the girl is a deeny girl, she's a religious girl, she's got good manners, she's got good akhlaq, and people are giving good references about her, the community knows her, if that is the case, then she's a good girl for your family, she's a good girl for your society. It's something that you should go forward with and consider it. Rather than having your son commit zina. Rather than your daughter committing zina. And some parents even know about this. But they don't want to even talk about it or know it. Brothers and sisters, the family life is what? Family life, when I base it upon Allah and His Messenger from the beginning, then all my children have to base it on Allah and His Messenger from the beginning. As they're growing up. And as they're going through life, they will continue and continue until through their teens. If I, have showed, if I showed them respect, then they will show me respect back. And the communication is to what? With the best of manners. When I see my son, I'm going to say, Bunay. I'm going to say, my beloved child. I'm going to have a sweet name for him. And that sweet name, keep it for them. Sweetness, sweet names. Love. Love is what? Love is from the heart. Kissing them on the cheeks. Making them, you know, giving them a nice hug. Saying assalamu alaikum to them. Making them feel warm around you. If you come home and your children run to you because you've come home, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. But if you come home and your children don't want to see you, then la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There are fathers, there are mothers who go home, especially some fathers I know of, they will go home, their children don't want to, oh my, dad, dad's here, dad's here, dad's here. Quick, quick, dad's here. How did that happen? My friend, how did that happen? The communication wasn't there. They don't communicate. And they start to get into a double life. They have a life behind your back. They have a life in front of your face. And kids will do that. Because they are human beings. And one day, it will come to a bust. Where they'll either, you will leave that house or they will leave that house. One day, something like that will happen. 
But that's not based on communication, relationship, good relationship. If the children continue to come, if they come to the father, run to the father, and the father actively goes out to see the children, to spend time with the children, to sit with the children. Subhanallah, this is what? This is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa remember my friends, that he put Fatima radiallahu anha in a different house. Some parents are so controlling, they have to have all the siblings and all their wives and all their children and all the grandchildren in a three-bedroom house. Now it's not going to work. Guys, it's not going to work. Even if you've got a four-bedroom house, it's not going to work. For even the next just 20 years time, you're going to outgrow yourself. And then they start politics. You know, one, wants, one son wants to leave the house. Huh? What is he saying? He wants to leave the house. And the guy, come on, he's in a room, he's got three children inside that room, he can just about breathe inside there, he wants to leave. Come on, what did Rasulullah sallallahu do? He planned ahead, he made Fatima radiallahu anha stay in a separate house with Sayyidina Ali. Both of them were living in his house from day number one. Sayyidina Ali was in the care of the Prophet sallallahu He was a cousin, brother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wanted to make both of them marry each other, so he, made, he married one another. And then he said, his accommodation stays separate. Fatima radiallahu anha, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she complained about what? She complained that her skin, her skin is peeling off of her hands because of the dough that she's making and the work that she's doing. So she said, my beloved father, she said, can you give us a khadim, a servant? And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa turned around and said, oh Fatima, when you and Ali go home, before you go to sleep, I want you to read Subhanallah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 34 times, or 33 times he said, before you go to sleep, you read that, that is better for you to read that than have a khadim, and have a servant. Allah will make things easy for you. Now look, his, daughter, his daughters come to him, and he could have given, because he had servants in his house, but he didn't want, he wanted his daughter to have that discipline. She is the daughter of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He could have made life very comfortable for her, for her, but he didn't. His intention was, I, you know children when they go through struggle, they become very nice, understanding, tough people. But if you, if you pamper them all the time, if you pamper them, they don't get that experience. They don't get that experience. You need to give them that raw edge sometimes. Let them go through that raw life of experience. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina, one of the first things he did, he went to Masjid Nabawi and he prayed Salah. And the second thing he did, he went to his daughter's house, Fatima radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. A father who has so much love, after giving his daughter away, he goes and after reading two rakats, he goes to visit his daughter. And to see Hassan and Hussein. And when he used to see Hassan and Hussein, Hassan and Hussein used to jump on him. Hassan and Hussein, there are so many riwayat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you know, we haven't got those hadith when Fatima was growing up because it was early, it was before Islam. When Fatima was growing up, it was before Islam. So we haven't got those hadith. But where do we see him with children? We see him with Hassan and Hussein. So what does he do? Subhanallah, you see him, when he goes, they jump on him. And sometimes he, he gets an old force. This is our Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our Prophet, Sayyidul Abrar, Sayyidul Awwalina wal Akhirin, Sayyidul, you know, Sayyidul, uh, uh, Sayyidul Thakalain. He is, the, he is the leader of the jinns, he is the leader of humankind, he is the leader of this world, he is the leader of the next world. He is the best, he is the highest authority you can ever find. Bigger than any mufti you will show me, bigger than any person of authority you show me, bigger than any hazrat, any sayyid, any big person you know, who wears a massive turban and who has a big cloak, but he will treat children and say, Bait jai dan mera saab ne, muni hilana, bas idhar bait ja. Right? I mean, you know that kind of aura they want to have around them. This is our Prophet ﷺ with his own grandchildren. He comes to them, they jump on him and he gets on all fours. And they go on his back. And they start to ride him like a camel or a horsey. They start, and Rasulullah ﷺ is giving him a ride. Who is giving him a ride? Our Prophet ﷺ, and a sahabi sees that. And he says, Messenger of Allah, what great person they are riding. And Rasulullah ﷺ comments and remarks and he says, what great riders they are. What great riders they are. He goes into sujood and, and then he doesn't get up for a long while. So this is a hadith. And then after that, the sahaba ﷺ, after they stay in sujood, saying sujood, saying sujood, saying sujood. And then they get up and some of them actually were, were, were they, they saw what ha- actually happened. So then they asked the Prophet ﷺ, the Messenger of Allah, why did you stay in sujood for, lo- for so long? He said, 
I went into sujood, and one of the he was Hassan or Hussein. They came, they jumped on his back. You know, kids do that. They jump on your back while you're in sujood, and they love it. It's like a rocking, you know, thing. Yeah, they love it, and they hold on to you. My kids do that, and every time they do that, I remember the hadith. So they hold on to you, and you stay. In, and what did Rasulullah say? He said, one of them came on my back. And if I had got up, he might have fallen down. So I stayed in sujood until he got off. Until he got off. They said, Messenger of Allah, why didn't you tell us? We could have gone there and we could have physically taken him off. He said, no, no. no. This is not the sunnah that he taught us. This is not the sunnah that he taught us. Allahu Akbar. He comes onto the member, hadith of Tirmidhi, Hassan Hussein run into the And he was just talking about fit, how children are a fitna. How there are trial for you. Right? And Hassan and Hussein, they run inside the masjid, and Rasulullah gets off the mimbar, and he hugs both of them. And he says, Innama amwalakum wa awlaadukum fitna. He says, Your wealth and your children are a trial for you. They're a fitna for you. And he hugs them with a smile on his face. He sees Hussein radiallahu anhu outside the hadith of Muatta. He sees him outside of the masjid, and he's with his companions. Rasulullah sees him. What does Rasulullah do? He runs after Hussein. He runs to grab him. Hussein plays hide and seek with him. Hussein runs be- behind another individual. So Rasulullah is trying to grab him. And then Hussein runs over there and he's trying to grab him until he grabs hold of him and then he gives him out. Subhanallah azim The love, the compassion he had for the children. Anas radiallahu anhu serves him from 8 years old till 18 years old. 8 to 18, the full teens, the prime age. You know kids, they normally go a bit wonky at 12, 13, 14, especially boys. Because the hormones are growing inside them. Suddenly the guy's two feet taller. <laughs> Suddenly his Adam's apple popped out. Right? Suddenly his voice has changed. He thinks, yeah, I'm a man now. Yeah? So he goes a bit funny. Right? Anas radiallahu anhu, prime age. 8 till 18, he was with Prophet sallallahu And he says he never wanted to leave him. Subhan, never wanted to leave him. <coughs> if, you have, if you show that muhabba, that love, always, to elders, to young ones, and they know that you're a loving person, they'll want to be with you. Of course. You're always showing them that mercy. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to see kids on the streets. He used to stroke their head. And they used to come running to him to, so that he could stroke their head. Because whoever's head he stroked, they would have the fragrance of atar from their head for the rest of the day. There's kids running to him. Kids running to him. Kids want to say salam to him. Allah, I love it when my students, they leave my, my maktab or my madza and they want to come and greet me. I, I say alhamdulillah from the bottom of my heart. Sometimes I can be a strict person and I'm sometimes, you know, I'm very firm with them. I'm not, I'm not harsh, but I can get very firm. But one thing is they leave cards for me, alhamdulillah. And I, and I want to say this, that, you know, we should be such people that after they've gone through their teenage life, they should know that whatever discipline you gave them, it was out of love. Out of love. And I really like it when my students, after they're 18, they're 19, they're 20, they want to go. And I've, I've told these guys off sometimes, really badly I've told them off. But they still want to know. Because the love, if you, you can tell your child off, but you can still show love. You can tell your child, one, look, one telling off is like this. One telling off is that, and remember, you did this, and remember, when you were 12 years old, you did this, and when you were 13, you did that, and when you were 14, you did that, and now you are 15 and you're doing this, and all that, and this guy, this, the guy goes, okay, here we go again. Don't bring history out. When you've forgiven something in history, leave it. That's past. Allah forgives, my friend, Allah forgives. Allah forgives and Allah leaves and Allah doesn't take you to account once He's forgiven you. So if you've forgiven your children for the past, don't carry on bringing it up. But whatever He's done currently, if you're telling Him off for that, tell Him in a moderate way, where you demonstrate that the love is still there. You know, you can tell. You can tell. If somebody, go back into your own, own head when people have told you off. The certain people who have told you off and you know, you can feel, you can almost feel that, you know, he's saying this because he really cares for me. And the certain people who told you off in your life, you thought that guy hates me. He hates my guts. Yeah? Right? You, you know that. You know what I'm talking about. Relatives, family members, you know, when you're young, your teachers told you off. You know which teacher hated you and told you off. And you know which person loved you and told you off. And they will read that. And your children are always reading that from you. So if you tell them off, harshly even, but they know that you really love them, next moment, 
After an hour, after two hours, they'll come and cuddle, they'll hug you. After one day, they'll really be so sorry. After within a couple of hours, they'll be so sorry. Because they know you love them. And straight away, you should, lo- you should show your love again. Show your love again. Don't change your character because one of them did something so bad. Now, the final thing I want to say to you, brother, now because time, is, time always you know, flies, the final thing I want to say to you is, brothers and sisters, you're all going to go home now. All right? And I want to give you... And I know all of you lot probably have got someone in the family or someone else in the family that you probably had some grudges, some, something else with them. But I'm going to do a quick exercise with you. And with that, I'm going to end this session. So I'm going to give you a quick exercise. Now it's only going to take a few minutes. So I just want you to stay for a few more minutes. And I'm going to do this exercise. All right? I want to all of you to close your eyes. So close your eyes. Go on. It's going to be for just one or two minutes. Close your eyes. Go on. Close your eyes. And go on. Close your eyes. It's alright. I'm sure you go to sleep and close your eyes. I don't understand why you can't close your eyes. Yeah? Close your eyes. It's alright. I'm not telling you to go to sleep. You're driving down or you're walking down. Let's say you're walking down. You're walking down your street from the, from the farthest end. You're walking down from your street. And it's a nice hot summer day. And you're walking down and you can feel the nice breeze in your face and you're really happy. And you're walking down, you're going to come home, you're going to relax, you're going to be with family. And, but there are certain people in your family that you're probably, you know, whatever, you're not happy. But you're coming home. And as you're coming towards your house, you can see an ambulance outside your house. The ambulance has got the sirens on. There's some people outside. There's a crowd, your neighbors are outside. People in locality outside. So you start to jog. You start to get, you know, you're thinking now, where's this? It's somewhere very near to my house. So you jog, you jog, you jog, you go, go all the way, and then you start running towards, because it's right in front of your house right now, right in front of your house. And you can see a stretcher coming out of your house. The hospital people are bringing a stretcher outside your house. And you go up to that, and you look at that, and you've only got seconds to see. And you see that that person in your family who you had grudges with is on that stretcher. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. That's it. They passed away. They're gone. They had a stroke. Something happened. Shock. Whatever it was. They're gone. They're dead. That family member is dead. Now, your beautiful day, your grudges, everything have gone. You're not thinking about... Are you thinking about grudges right now? Are you thinking about grudges right now? If it was your mother, if it was your sister, if it was someone who you had some grudges with, and that person passed away, that person dead. And you never ever got the chance to talk about your problems to them. Never got the chance to get their forgiveness or to forgive them. Would you feel happy right now? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. Everyone's saying no. I want you to do one thing. Your sister, your brother, your sibling, your child, your parent, whoever they are, Tomorrow they could be dead. Tomorrow literally they could be dead. Tonight they could be dead. It could be written for them that they die tonight. Go home my brothers, go home my sisters. And go, doesn't matter what grudge you've got. I want you to go first, your own blood, your family member. I want you to go home straight away. Say salam to them and give them a hug. Give them a hug. They're going to they're be surprised. What are you giving them a hug for? Give them a hug. Sit down with them. And say the Imam just said that this could be the last moments. And it could be. Don't doubt it. It could be the last moments. And we don't know when, we, when each, any one of us is going to die. And I'm here tonight to talk. Tonight. I want you to do tonight. Don't wait till tomorrow. Tonight's a Saturday night. If you don't find them tonight, tomorrow morning, first thing you're going to do this. I want you to spend, just take two hours out. Take out one hour, one and a half hours out. I want you to sit down and say, if I died right now, or if you died right now, how would we feel about each other? That we've never been able to... I know one family, alright? I know one family member, I'm not going to say what. But they ha- just had a grudge with the, with the brother. And suddenly the brother died. And you know the biggest regret for years now, for years now is what? That I never got to resolve the grudge with my brother. It kills them inside. Sit with them and I want you to solve and resolve whatever you've got between yourselves and say, say what? Say look, the Imam said that we should base it on Allah and His Messenger. And if the person is not practicing whatever it is, 
Just try and make the best amends you can with them now. At least get your forgiveness. Get your forgiveness. And try and make it work. How you're going to try and make it work is that you're going to show love. Don't talk about them not showing you love. See, most, po- pro- most people, they, they say, Did you see he did that? Did you see he did that? Then he started it. He did that. I know they did it. Why are you complaining about the other? Well, show you. Where's your love? Where's your difference? Where's your compassion? Where's your justice? You show it first. Don't wait for the other person to show it. You show it first. Go and show your salam. Go and show your smile. Go and show that you love them. Then after weeks or months, tell me if they don't show it to you. Or if they don't, at least they'll feel bad inside. They'll feel bad that my brother, or my son, or my father, or my whatever, they've shown this love to me, and I can't have the courtesy to show love to them. Will you do these, this for me, brothers? Two things I've asked you to do. Yes? One is you're going to go and talk to them. And I know whoever it is, and whatever, even if it's distant relative, go and sit, sit with them, go and shake hands with them, go and sit down, and go and sort it out. You don't want to wait till the Day of Judgment. Some people think that if I wait till the Day of Judgment, I'm going to get more. No! No, 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 I tell you. If you can get your forgiveness in this world, or you can forgive them in this world, you get a lot more than waiting till the Day of Judgment. It's clear in Hadith. If you wait till the Day of Judgment, yes, you can sort it out there. And you can wait till Allah gives you certain reward from them. You can wait then. But the reward you will get, the greatest Jannah that you will get, that Allah has written for you is from forgiveness in this world, if you can do that right now. So I'm asking you two things. One is that you go home and you talk to them. And next thing is that you, you show your side of kindness and your side of love. Jazakumullah khair. Wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.